Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor, and today I'm joined by Lauren Conaboy. Lauren is the Vice President of National Policy at Centerstone a not-for-profit health system specializing in mental health and substance use disorder treatments. Through her advocacy, Lauren has directly influenced the passage of several bills, including passing legislation to create the nation's first ever three-digit dialing code for suicide prevention, 988, as well as directly influencing several provisions of the 2018 Support Act, a bill designed to combat the nation's opioid crisis. In addition to over a decade of experience running state and national policy and advocacy campaigns, Lauren has also worked in the clinical realm as a marriage and family therapist. And in 2019, Lauren was recognized by Business Insider as a top DC health policy power player. I'm so excited to have Lauren with us today as we speak about the mental health epidemic brought on by COVID-19 pandemic. Lauren, welcome to our show. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. Nice to have you. You know, Lauren, as we come into this whole topic of mental health epidemic being experienced within our nation and the impact of COVID-19, I'm aware that, you know, we've become a society that easily and sometimes ignorantly and carelessly throw around terms, often without fully understanding their meaning and their implication. So as we come into today's topic, could you start us out by grounding us in a clear understanding of what's occurring currently with the mental health of our nation being at such a level that is considered an epidemic? Yeah, great question and great way to frame that up. So to start with the definition of an epidemic, an epidemic refers to an increase in one that is typically sudden in the number of cases of the disease Mm -hmm. above what is normally expected in that population. Given that context, I do believe we're moving in that direction. Yeah. For example, the CDC estimated that an average of nearly 250 Americans died from overdoses every day in the 12 months leading up to September 2020. That's almost a 30% increase from the previous year. Sadly, more Americans lost their lives to an overdose in that time frame than in any other time in history. When we look at mental health specifically, a CDC report from last August found that one in four young adults, young adults, which was surprising to me, mm-hmm. had recently contemplated suicide. So to me, as a former therapist and now someone who evaluates behavioral health policy, mm-hmm. there's little question that we're in the midst of an emerging mental health epidemic. Yeah. Yeah. And that has been largely fueled by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Uh, You know, you mentioned overdose and suicide ideation in these stats, and not to mention eight in 10 adults saying that the COVID uh, virus pandemic is a significant source of stress in their life. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of how the pandemic has impacted various demographics and age groups. And and tell me, are, are there some groups that you're finding that are more at risk than others? Good question. So something I think that has been surprising, um, surprising and not surprising is is the impact on children. So during the pandemic, children's emergency room visits related to mental health have spiked dramatically up 24% for children five to 11 years old, and 31% for teenagers 12 to 17 years old. Mm. So this affirms something we already suspected. Children have been really struggling this past year. However, in terms of demographics, this population was primarily white and had commercial insurance. Mm. So while the data I mentioned is really alarming, it's also not a good demonstration of the number of children that may actually need access to care. In fact, additional reporting has indicated that the mental health needs are likely elevated for communities of color who are more likely to be adversely impacted by COVID-19. For example, during the first several months of the pandemic, African Americans were three times as likely to know someone who had died from COVID-19 than white Americans. All in all, while almost everyone has experienced some level of trauma this year, communities of color were at elevated risk and had less access to services than other populations. Fortunately, the COVID relief packages passed by Congress have provided additional resources for housing, food security, as well as additional funding for state Medicaid programs to expand access to mental health and addiction treatment. However, more still needs to be done. Yeah, I can, I can see that as well. I see that in my state also with some of the the monies being received and, and used, but there's a a, a terrific need. 
You know, uh, shifting just uh, a little bit more kind of within and, and personally, and as a mental health practitioner yourself, we had a, a guy, Dr. Steve Taylor on our show. He's a clinical psychologist and professor at the University of British Columbia, Canada, on a podcast in the early stages of the pandemic. He's a kind of an expert in the pandemics. And we talked about how two of our greatest fears uh, are the fear of the unknown and the fear of feeling out of control and not having control mm -hmm. and how being without the level of the relational contact that we're used to and dependent upon, we've seen the impact of isolation and loneliness with a whole new appreciation for sure. So in terms of the isolation and the secondary loneliness that accompanies this uh, as an inherent part of the pandemic, what are you seeing being the impact on our psychology, both kind of at a community level, but also at a personal level as well? Yeah, and some of the issues you just identified are so critical for us, mm -hmm. the ability to have control and, and kind of yeah. know what's coming. And, and as humans, we're also very hardwired for connection to support our emotional well-being and health. And to bring this to light, there's two examples that come to mind. The first is mirror neurons. And so in the simplest form, that's when we observe another individual performing an act or exhibiting a particular emotion, let's say love or affection. It's fairly common for the neurons in our own brains to replicate similar feelings. Yeah. In the instance of the global pandemic, most of us have been isolated. We were watching terrifying news headlines unfold before us. It was a constant stream of the pandemic, social injustice and unrest, and an insurrection on top of that. We yeah. watched all of these traumatic events in isolation. We didn't have the healing and connection that comes from being in community. You know, that's so important. I just want to kind of jump in on that. You know, we sometimes as, as practitioners refer to that as kind of vicarious trauma or secondary trauma, don't we? Where we're not actually there. We saw this really most clearly with 9-11, where we had to tell people to turn off their televisions because they were having sleep disturbances, irritability, all these things just simply from watching. And that's what you're talking about right now, isn't it? That the secondary trauma, this vicarious trauma is really real. And people were going through that, weren't they? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And then I think to add to that, I think there's another even relational context. So my background being in marriage and family therapy, I used to work with couples going through divorces or yeah. someone going through a breakup. And if they, when they came in after the fact, they often reported that they, they felt like the rug had been pulled out from underneath them. And that's because relationships are such a formative foundation for us. And it can send our bodies into a little bit of a fight or flight mode when we're trying to navigate our new way to meeting and connection. And so I think all these things we were just talking about, you know, that inability to control what's happening, watching these things unfold, the secondary trauma, all of that, you know, kind of wrapped into this 24 seven stream right. of things that were happening just kept, you know, many of us in the state where we had some level of feeling anxious, sad, or angry, or all of the above. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think those were some of the feelings that we we had never been exposed to before, to the degree that we were. And I think what, one of the things we appreciated was just how important relationships are to us, you know, in our lives and how stabilizing and grounding they are and how dependent we are on them. And maybe not until they were kind of removed or the mandated isolation or quarantines brought that to light. You know, we're talking right now and you're drawing attention to the idea of the relational piece but we also had to make some adjustments, some significant adjustments to our work environments. Talk about how we get to or need to still maintain some good mental health to address the inherent job burnout that many are experiencing. Yeah, so, so that burnout from this year and all the complicating factors that played in can show up in a lot of ways. It can show up in our jobs, our relationships, and in our own mental and physical health. Thanks to science and all the incredible work there, there's vaccines available for those 12 and up, and we're seeing a lot of the restrictions we've had this past year be lifted. And so it's really important we find ways to start decompressing. Yes. That could be something as extravagant as going on a vacation, and, and many of us deferred vacations this year, and so that's well-deserved and well-timed. But it could be also something as simple as walking in the park a few times a week with family and friends. Overall, after these past 14 months, we really have to train our brain that it doesn't need to be vigilant and on alert all the time and really, really emphasize ways to relax and unwind and to start to really decompress this past year. 
Yeah. Let's 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 kind of piggyback on that just for a second. You're talking about the the importance of decompressing, but also you're talking about we need to be also intentional in processing this past year. Are are there some things that you've observed folks doing, or maybe even as a mental health practitioner, you've encouraged folks to consider doing? Maybe even maybe some things maybe you've done this year that's helped you process through the things that we've had to go through. Yeah, you know, for this year, I can give just a a brief personal example. On March 22nd, my husband and I welcomed our first child, Ava, and we came home from the hospital just as our the state that we live in, Colorado, was Uh, issuing the shutdown orders of, you know, everything was shut down. mm -hmm. And and on one hand, when I look back at the past year, I feel a sense of grief for the lost time with friends and family, especially when she was a newborn. But I also feel a very immense sense of gratefulness that we didn't have to travel for our jobs. Both of us before this had to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we were able to be home with her is really our silver lining. And I think a lot of us have this. We have something that we're grieving and something that we're, we're grateful for. It can make processing this a little bit more complicated. But I also want to recognize that not everyone had silver linings. For some, it's just been a really difficult year. In terms of processing this year, you know, it's our often our default to push past the grief and focus on moving forward or the silver lining and say, I'm good. And, and that's kind of our default as a society. And from my experience, personally and professionally, I believe it can be helpful to hold and understand some of that grief and mm-hmm. process it. Mm-hmm. And so I would say for anyone that wanted to explore this, I would suggest carving out some time to journal, meditate, go on a walk and think about this, but really think about what was lost and hold on to that and feel through those emotions and not try to push past them right away. But what was lost? What was gained? And importantly, what was learned this past mm-hmm. year? Mm-hmm. While it can be very helpful to recognize the hurt and really, really hold on to that, It's also really useful to ask yourself, how am I gonna use these lessons from this past year to build a healthier life for myself or for my family? Mm -hmm. Reflection and visioning for the future can be a really healthy process to understand and work through difficult emotions and even come out on the other end a little stronger and healthier. So that being said, I think for those that have had truly acute loss this past year, the process can take longer and be a little bit more complicated. But fortunately, as we know from our field, recovery, healing, and resilience is possible. Yeah, I, I really appreciate both those parts, the processing of the grief, I, and then the idea of the, this concept of resilience as well. I know that sitting with grief can be a very, very healthy process to put something in its proper place. In fact, when we, I think when we process grief the way you're encouraging us to, mm-hmm. we honor and respect what we've gone through. And if there are losses there that are, that are challenging for us, we get to honor and respect and, 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 and hold those in a different way from the intentional processing and hold those and carry those into our lives in a different way. But, and I also really like, you know, this idea of recognizing and reflecting on our resilience and the importance of relationships that you keep coming back to here in a good way. This could be really helpful as we recognize, you know, the choices that we've got coming up that we get to make regarding how we come back into life as things open back up. And ideally, we just don't default back into what we've always done or always known. To me, that would be lazy. And that would be a wasted opportunity in some ways. Instead, I'm hoping that we choose, you know, to be more intentional and purposeful. And ideally, we're going to be informed by and with an appreciation of what we learned is most important in our lives and to us during this time that we've lived through, leading us then to construct, you know, a life around those things that are most important as things open back up. So it's an intentional and well-designed life. Yes, I love that. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Continuing education is both a requirement and a learning opportunity, but finding the right CE provider can be challenging. AATBS, a triad company, offers continuing education for psychologists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, counselors, and behavior analysts. CE courses are available both individually and as part of our new All Access Pass. All Access Pass provides a library of over 250 unique courses. That's more than 800 hours of CEs, with new courses being added every month. As a special offer, Behavioral Health Today listeners can save 15% on CE purchases. Visit us at aatbs.com slash BHT and enter promo code BHT15 during checkout. 
That's aatbs.com slash BHT. Check out our library and check off your CE requirements today. Yeah. You know, I, I so appreciate some stats that kind of ground us in an understanding of things. And in addition to the stats that you shared earlier, you know, we know that mental illness is a significant part of our lives as a nation. One in five adults, you know, talking earlier are going to experience a mental health illness each year. Roughly 10% of people are going to experience a major depressive episode this year, 20% an anxiety disorder. The stat that blows my mind is the one in six youth, six to 17 are going to experience a mental health disorder and the suicide being the second leading cause of death for folks 10 to 34. We had a great uh, show with Kevin Hines. I encourage people to go back and listen to that podcast as well. And I know you guys have all worked with him. We're going to come back and talk about 988 in a little bit, but not to mention the opioid crisis. And I know all of these things impact our employment, unemployment rates, legal system, our healthcare costs. What a rippling effect those things can have. Having your ear to the rail through your advocacy at the national level, I know you're privy to some of the conversations that are occurring that impact policy and programs. Share with us, if you would, Lauren, what, what's being discussed by our congressional leaders regarding our nation's mental health needs? Yeah, and I, I think this is a really exciting question because it's not stuff that's covered in the media. Uh, we don't typically talk about the things where Congress is holding hands and agreeing on. And so yeah. Congress has actually had a, a lot of hearings uh, over the past couple of months on this issue. In the House side, there was a recent hearing called the epidemic within the pandemic, understanding substance use and misuse in America. On the Senate side, there's also been a range of hearings on, on these topics. To me, something that is particularly hopeful is that when you watch these hearings, it's not a bipartisan issue. Members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, representative and senator, understand that addressing mental health is more critical than ever. Yeah, I, I so hope that we can rise above all the names that we put after our names, sides taken, and just recognize that we are all one family. We're, we're all one family, and we've got to take care of the family in those ways. But are there other ways that you see Congress taking action to address this need for increased services? Yeah, so there's two really big ones. During the pandemic, we unleashed a lot of flexibilities for telehealth. And so the ability to call up your provider via your phone or to have a video appointment as well. And, and we're really urging Congress to look at what those flexibilities have done. They've done a few things. The ability for somebody to call with audio only or just their phone means that people in rural areas that don't have broadband internet or live hours away from their mental health provider yeah. can have a phone conversation with their psychiatrist or their, their therapist. And it really breaks down those barriers to care. People that are um, struggling with childcare issues, everything from that all the way to even having access to the technology, the ability to use your phone to access that care is so critical. And then for individuals that do have the ability to do both the, the audio and visual, the video conferencing type appointments, mm -hmm. it's so convenient. And it means that because of telehealth and because of these flexibilities, people can access care in a way they never could before. And so we're really urging Congress to continue those flexibilities beyond the public health emergency because they're not only helpful today, but they will be helpful for access beyond the public health emergency. Yeah, those are really good. And then the second area that we've been really focusing on is the implementation of 988. So you briefly mentioned this, but 988 is the nation's first ever three digit dialing code for suicide emergencies or mental health emergencies. This line will go live July, 2022. So I want to emphasize it's not live today, but as of July, 2022, our nation will have the first ever three digit dialing code for mental health emergencies. With regard to Congress, we're really urging that they ensure that this has the resources it needs to be done right. So that when this goes live, if someone in a moment of crisis calls that phone number, they get somebody that's trained and they have access to the care they need. Fantastic. I, I want to flag that and come back to that just in a little bit here, but I want to piggyback on first this telemental health opportunity that we have. I know that during the pandemic, we've seen telehealth allow mental health practitioners to extend their service reach. And like you're saying, for patients to have greater access to mental health treatment. We also know that in general, around 80 million Americans live in a mental health professional shortage area and less than a quarter of the estimated 45 million adult Americans with a mental health illness 
are not going to seek treatment for a myriad of reasons, including the stigma and embarrassment, uh, even some things like convenience, et cetera, that, or just some of the stigma around, you know, comes up naturally just in the pursuit of treatment. So we can clearly see, like you're mentioning, how telemental health can help solve many of these access problems, as well as some of the perceptual problems related to seeking help just in and of itself. You mentioned telehealth earlier and the concept of health equity. Mm-hmm. Help me understand more about the ways that you see telehealth playing a role in these. Yeah, I'll give a couple of consumer stories. Okay. One of our patients in an urban area used to take three buses to get to an appointment. Yeah. And she reports by the time she got to the appointment, had the appointment, took the three different buses to get back home, it would take anywhere between four and six hours. Yeah. Now, if you imagine somebody that would have to go in once a week or twice a week for those services, but is also trying to be a parent, trying to have a full-time job, mm-hmm doing that kind of work to take care of yourself is just not possible for so many. We've heard the same story from patients in rural areas that have had a two hour one-way trip. So four hours in total of driving to get to their provider. And again, you think about somebody trying to work a full-time job and juggle everything else that is, it's a, it's a huge barrier to access. And so when you remove that, you're really kind of lowering the playing field so that more people have access to this care and that it's not only for the people that can have the time to do that, that people that can even find 50 minutes in their day to do a video appointment or a phone appointment can then access care. And that can be a game changer for a lot of people. Yes. Yeah, that's a great story. That's, and, and, it, and that's real life. And that's helping us appreciate really the impact of telemental health coming in in such a, uh, an, an effective way. I know your organization does a lot of uh, research around things. Have you found that there's a difference in any clinical outcomes with telehealth versus in-person care? Yeah. So at Centerstone, we're fortunate in that we have a research institute and mm-hmm. analytics staff. And so we're able to look at the care we're delivering and, and assess our outcomes. But I'll first start by mentioning that on the whole nationwide, providers around the nation have seen a significant reduction in no-share rates with telehealth, yeah. Yeah. especially for substance use disorder treatment services. Mm-hmm. And we also know that when people are adhering to their treatment, they tend to have better outcomes. So within our own research institute, what we have found is that for treatment of depression, when delivered via telehealth versus in-person, the outcomes are the same in terms of our clinical outcomes. For substance use disorder, we've actually found that our treatment outcomes with telehealth have been slightly better when compared to- Is that right? Oh, that's That's correct. Yeah. I didn't know that. So all in all, I I think we're seeing a strong clinical case for the efficacy of telehealth, that it can really stand up to in-person care. And that's not to say that it works for everybody. We we say, you know, our practitioners have to use clinical best judgment, and there are patients that will need to come into the office for all of their treatment or for part of it. But on the whole, most of our patient population is able to access care through telehealth and is seeing similar outcomes as they would if they were coming in person. Yeah, that's really exciting. You know, there was a concern at the very beginning that's going to be, you know, less effective and there's going to be, you know, kind of a barrier between, but you know, some of the research I've done as well, and it it talks about the same things you're talking about here, this, you know, there's no statistical difference between the two modalities in person versus, uh, you know, internet-based. And they're showing that, you know, there's a high patient satisfaction in this for a number of reasons you've mentioned from the convenience to accessibility, et cetera, and a moderate to high clinician's experience and positive clinical outcomes. That's really exciting. Like you said, it, it, it demonstrates that this online medium of providing mental health services can really benefit those in our communities in need of this care. Are, are you hoping that uh, Congress continues to focus on this and hoping that they do anything with regard to telehealth in the upcoming uh, sessions? Absolutely. We are strongly urging them to make permanent all the flexibilities that they have initiated during the pandemic. Yeah, good. It would, it would be great to have those things continued because I think we're kind of getting used to it. It's going to it's become a natural part of how we do our work. Yeah. I want to go back to the flag that I planted earlier, this idea of 988 and this legislation. Congratulations, you've been a part of. This is the second major area that Congress is delving into. Tell me more about that, what they're delving into, and where it is now, and where you're hoping to see it go. Yeah, so just a little bit of background. Last fall, President Trump signed into law legislation to effectuate 988 by July 2022. 
The federal legislation had passed unanimously through Congress also gives states authorities to levy fees on wireless bills to cover the cost mm -hmm. of crisis services. Nice. In addition, the FCC also has issued a final rule mandating that all wireless and wireline carriers have 988 operational by July 2022. So today we're in a, in a good place. We're in the implementation phase of 988. There are a ton of moving pieces. And for me, one of the lingering questions, I think for many working on this, is how are we going to appropriately fund this program? Mm. So right now, while states begin the process of evaluating potential fees on wireless bills, which is today how 911 is paid for, okay. Congress is also looking at increasing the federal funding to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, as well as taking steps to provide resources for crisis services. That is awesome. So if you foresee 988 being done right, what's it going to look like? The vision is that anyone, anywhere, anytime would have 24-7 access to trained crisis counselors mm -hmm. and if needed, mobile crisis services and crisis stabilization. Additionally, the hope is that we will also eventually have text and so that individuals can text 988 as well. That's very important because that can open the doors for more vulnerable populations who may be fearful to reach out to be able to access those services as well. Yeah, I can't imagine all the moving pieces around and all the details around bringing this together. I can't even begin to get my head around that, but I can, I can begin to envision with you what a phenomenal service if we as a nation can have this in place. So congrats on the work around that and kind of helping to steward and shepherd that to being done. Nicely done. I know we're beginning to wind down, but let's get real practical. What if uh, someone today, even someone listening into our show, if they're experiencing a mental health crisis, what would you recommend to them, Lauren? Yeah, I would recommend that they call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The number for that is 1-800-273-TALK. Good. Good. We'll also put that up on our site for anybody that wants to come on in, giving access to that. I know as clinicians, we're always encouraging people just to kind of talk to people as well, don't we? Mm -hmm. Talk about whatever you're going on. And I remember one thing is Kevin Hines says, just talk to somebody, just reach out because most people want to listen and be available to us. As we wind down today, Lauren, give us some resources that you'd recommend and encourage some of our listeners to, to follow up on and ways that we might engage with Centerstone and the care that you folks offer. Yeah, so the best way to reach us is by giving us a call at 1-877-HOPE-123, or easiest probably is by visiting our website, which is centerstone.org. Very good. I love that phone number, 1-877-HOPE-123. <laughs> that works. Yeah. That's really good. Really good. Well, Lauren, it's been awesome to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do it. Congratulations on your work. You're touching uh, the lives of, well, our nation here, both with the 988 and the telemental health and really allowing mental health services, much needed services, services that uh, are being put into place because of the epidemic that's being experienced in our mental health. And these are areas that we can control. These are areas that we can address. So thank you for what you're doing. Congratulations on what you're doing. And thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all for the work you're doing. It's been great to have you. I also want to thank you, our listeners, for being with us on our show today. We'll look forward to having you join us next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.